During the nationwide broadcast of President Bola Tinubu on the celebration of Nigeria's 64th Independence Day on Tuesday, he announced that security forces have eliminated over 300 commanders of Boko Haram and bandit groups in the last one year. Speaking on the nation's security situation, Tinubu expressed optimism about the progress made in combating terrorism and violent extremism. He said, on the security front, I am happy to announce to you, my compatriots, that our administration is winning the war on terror and banditry. Our target is to eliminate all the threats of Boko Haram, banditry, kidnapping for ransom, and the scourge of all forms of violent extremism. Within one year, our government has eliminated Boko Haram and bandit commanders faster than ever, end of quote. The president also noted that peace had been restored to numerous northern communities, allowing displaced residents to return to their homes. He pledged continued efforts to ensure stability, particularly for farmers who he expected to return to their farms and boost food production, ultimately lowering food prices. Joining us now on The Morning Show as we review the victories of the Nigerian Armed Forces against banditry and insurgencies, General Christopher Gwabin Musa OFR, Nigeria's Chief of Defense Staff. Good morning, sir, and good to see you on The Morning Show. Good morning. Thank you. Once again, good to be here. Well, General, good to have you on the program. Mario has already referred to uh, what the president said, that about 300 Boko Haram commanders have been eliminated. Persons are returning from my, uh, internally displaced persons camps to their homes. Peace is being restored. But President Chinubu also said that it is still an unfinished business. How unfinished is the business? Uh, thank you, Dr. Abati. Uh, it's always good to be here. Uh, unfinished in the sense that we still have work to do. Uh, it's not yet Uhuru totally. Well, uh, again, it is um, almost impossible to expect that uh, we'll have total peace in the entire world. Uh, you know, the challenges we're facing is not only to Nigeria alone. The sub-region is going through stress, Africa, and indeed the entire world. The um, Russia-Ukrainian war is causing a lot of issues for us. The recent uh, uh, Israeli, Palestinian, now Lebanese, and Iranian wars are also, they have implications. But again, we still have implications here in Nigeria. So uh, it's not only for us alone, and that's why we always want to appeal to Nigerians, firstly, to support their armed forces, to support the country as a whole, the challenges we're facing is not isolated. Yeah, the challenges we're facing is a Nigerian challenge. Nigerians must take on the responsibility. Uh, I'm happy to be here because uh, you give us a platform where we can talk directly with Nigerians and then let them understand that they equally have roles to play for us to be able to succeed. So it's work in progress. We're not where we want to be, but we're heading there and we're sure we're heading towards the right way. Excellent. All right, you talk about roles that Nigerians have to play. I have two questions for you. The first is, what are some of those roles? Because the people are watching, so this is an opportunity to actually detail some of the things that Nigerians ought to be doing to complement the efforts of the military. Now, in talking about complementing the efforts, my second question would then be the statement made by Senator Ali Ndume. I don't know if you've heard about it. But he said that perhaps the military should yeah. consider engaging military contractors to fully decimate and win the war against terrorism, particularly Boko Haram in Nigeria. What's your take on that? Do you agree with him? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, of recent, you know that we have military contractors in Mali. How far have they gone? Uh, the Americans have used military contractors in Afghanistan. They fought for over 20 years. They packed and left and didn't finish the war. So, what I'm saying is that asymmetric warfare is a very, very difficult operation. Why? Because you are dealing with non-state actors, people you don't know. These are your own people. Uh, the only way we identify them is if you see them armed. Uh, these guys, immediately you move in, they drop the arms, they hide the arms, and then they are normal civilians. And again, even when they are carrying these arms, they try to blend within the civilian population, so that it makes it extremely difficult. One of the reasons why this uh, uh, campaign has been prolonged for this long is because we are obeying human rights. We try to, as much as possible, know that if there are civilian populace within the general area, we avoid collateral damage, except if necessary. But that has made it a bit difficult. 
Uh, but we remain focused, we remain very professional. Uh, Senator Ndomi has said, and you know, there's freedom of speech in democracy. Uh, so I understand uh, uh, probably uh, he is looking at it, trying to look at options. But f for us, it is not an option. We're doing a lot of joint training with the Americans, with the European Union team. So we're doing a lot together to build capacity in order to project this war. The war we're facing is not your kind of conventional warfare where the enemy is there, you know where he is, you can always go and get him here and there. These guys are highly mobile. Like I said, once you are going after them, there are informants that give them up-to-date information about your, your movement, your strength, your capabilities, and then they blend as quickly as possible. The Northwest has a land mass of kilometers. It is massive. It is highly forested. A very difficult terrain, and we share a common border with our neighboring countries with Benin Republic and Niger. 1,500 1, kilometers with Niger. That's, that's also very big. So these are challenges we're facing. Uh, the 300 that was mentioned is still counting. Uh, I think we've done more than that. Uh, but as it is, because we have high rate of poverty, illiteracy, and so they have a way of recruiting as quickly as possible. So it makes it look as if we're not working. But I can uh, guarantee you that we're doing well. Uh, Contractors, military contractors are not the solution. The money you are going to give them because you are going to pay them heavily. Yeah. Why not use that military and equip your own, uh, use that money to equip your own military? Okay. That would be a better option. And I think okay. we can do that. I'm very happy that the Mr. President has approved the bill for DICON Defense Industry Corporation of Nigeria to partner with other uh, original uh, manufacturers to produce in situ. I think that would be our solution. Uh, what we have realized over these years, why again these things have been prolonged is even with our money, we can't get the equipment that we need. Now, in Ukraine, anywhere you go under equipment, it makes it, they take priority other than you. Except we produce what we need, that will give us the leverage, and I think we're working towards that. Uh, we've started now, we are producing our own ammunition. We have local contractors uh, like Proforce that is producing local APCs. We have uh, EPL that is producing uh, local, we have Im Im Imperium, they are producing local APCs. I think it's by few years time, we also will be able to produce and also sell to our neighboring countries. And I think that will give us leverage. I mean, General, I, I completely agree with you, owing to the fact that, you know, sometimes we might not agree on much, but I agree with you. And, and before you came here, I made a strong case that Nigeria has one of the best fighting force you can ever think of. <clears throat> and that what we just need is training, you know, proper training. Because even in the time past, when the military contractors were here, the strike for 72 during 2014, 2015, it was still our troops that did most of the work. And they did most of that clearing. And Very it was, it, they made it possible yeah. for President Jonathan to come up to, I think it was Baghdad dead, and we could have elections that period. So I dove my heart for the fighting force. We have a yeah. great fight. And I salute you guys uh, this morning, if you, if, if you see me. But we have some problems. Morale is a big problem. Yeah. And I also want to ask you about female officer Ruth. Did you people handle that matter properly? I mean, we talk about defending the rights of women here. We feel largely, and I'm talking about society in general, that that woman was just done away with. Allegations were not listened to. They were quick to say she was mentally unbalanced and all of that. Please, let's make a case for that woman. Yeah, and we you, want to you, fight you, for that woman thank, this morning. Thank you, Rufai. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, I can tell you as commanders, we fight for our men. We fight for our men more than any other thing. And I can bet you, if you ask any of our men outside, they will tell you we stand for them, we protect them. But you know, there are limitations. Um, this same lady you were talking about did not start this year. It had been ongoing for a very long time. Everybody had tried to assist the lady to ensure that she's properly taken care of, looked after. It's not because she's mentally and then we just drop her. No, we don't do that. We went through the process. We got the medical men to go through her, looked at it. We tried to assist her. But one thing people don't understand, everybody that tried to help her, she came after the person and maligned that. Even myself, I'm sure you had comments she made that she reported. She did report. She, committed, she communicated with me directly. And I was able to get across to her commanders. We took her to the medical. And that's the procedure. The medical were able to go through it and looked at her. And the case was investigated that uh, um, uh, she said she was uh, sexually harassed or by a commander. It doesn't happen. If, if it does, we have our court marshals and we take action. We do not hide our men. Anybody who commits an offense will go for it. My policy is you do well, you are rewarded. You do badly, you get punished. So the commander is not that it was thoroughly investigated. 
we found out that she has some mental issues. Yes, sometimes she might t t seem to be coherent in what she's saying. Remember that even the chief of Amistad, she came after him that he wanted her to send his nude picture or whatever. I mean, these are the things that will never happen. Uh, so please be rest assured that we take care of our men. Their welfare is of paramount importance. And I'm sure you have uh, listened to us since last year. Sir. We've always talked about the welfare of our men because we know without good welfare, they will not be able to give us their best. Sir, so we're always out on looking out for them, watching out for them, Sir. appealing for increment in their salaries, appealing for, for increment in, in their uh, ration cash allowance, which we call RCA, so that they can do better. Okay. But I can tell you that we're working we are committed Sir, and will continue to work. I want to go back to that lady's case because what she said in the interview was different. Yeah. She was even saying that the dismissal, you know, was not even a dismissal in the first place, that, you know, it was an agreement by both parties. And what the army made it seem was different. She even, even gave more, you know, copious insights into that incident as regards the sexual advances being made at her and she saying, you know, no to it. Uh, what were the authorities that even investigated that she was medically unstable? Because this issue, I know you people in the military, you have your own internal mechanism, but it's already a public issue. And for us, it's the optics at which it looks at in the public that we do not like. By the virtue of this show, I think can we reassess yes. that matter? Can we reassess that matter for the sake of transparency? I know you people are, are fair accompli on it, but can we reassess for the interest of justice? General? General, you can go ahead. Yeah, OK. Yes, OK. I, I didn't really get the last part of your speech, but I, I think you talked about the issue of uh, reassessing the, uh, the, the, the matter. Of course, uh, mental issues, especially in the military, is something we view very, very seriously. Because you give somebody who is mentally unstable, he has ability to carry a weapon, he can take down everybody that is there when the issues come up. And so it's something that we view very seriously. And we don't want, we respect anybody who is committed himself to serve in the military because we know you have laid down, you have agreed to lay down your life for your country. So for us as commanders, it's something we take very seriously. We appreciate that. And so we want to also make sure that their health status are well respected. And that's why we went through the entire process. We have our procedures. For every aspect of the military, we have our procedures. And those are the procedures that were followed. Uh, a review, of course, it's possible to have a review. OK, General. Uh, I'm sure it will not come out anything different. That I can guarantee you. OK, General. But we will not do anything to impugn on our own personnel. We will not. OK, General, let me take you back to this point about private military contractors. Your predecessor, General Lucky Rabo, said, no, 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 no private military contractors. We are up to the task. Uh, the Nigerian military can do it. But, OK, you have repeated more or less the same thing, saying, no, 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 such an option is not on the table. But the same Nigerian government engages domestic corporate security outfits, either you know, along the Gulf of Guinea or in the Northeast and Northwest, uh, what does that say about the capacity of uh, the Nigerian military? Because these domestic security outfits, the basic comment that they make by their very engagement is that the Nigerian military cannot handle you know, some of these uh, assignments. That's one. Number two, uh, Senator Adam Sushomole, not too long ago, on the floor of the Senate, challenged the Nigerian uh, military and said, funds appropriated to the Nigerian military are usually used by Niger the military hierarchy either to go and build universities in their hometowns or to go and do CSR in their hometowns without using the same uh, appropriated funds to uh, uh, you know, uh, do their main assignment. Well, the Senate shut down that uh, motion, but the question is still out there as a matter of public interest. What is uh, transparency and accountability in the military governed by martial law that is different from the transparency and accountability that we civilians talk about? Uh, thank you, Dr. Abati. Um, uh, 
Janara, please go ahead. Thank you, Doctor. But yeah, somehow, some, yes, somehow towards the end, uh, I didn't hear what you have to say. But uh, just to respond to this, that the military is highly professional. That I can guarantee. We've spent. There is no general we have in the army today that has sp spent less than 25 years in service. We have been to Liberia. We've been to Sierra Leone. We've been to other countries. We've done so much. We're here in our country facing these challenges. And like I said, asymmetric warfare is a diff entirely different operation. On the issue of transparency, I can guarantee you that we are going through every scrutiny that is there on the land. We are facing, we have auditors that always come consistently to do that. And when you talk about uh, use of funds in building universities and building and um, doing civil, that is asymmetric warfare. And that's what we call the non-kinetic part of it. We have two options, the kinetic and the non-kinetic. The kinetic is where we use military force. The military force to solution to non uh, uh, to non-state actors or to asymmetric warfare is just about 20-25% of the solution. Mistake people always make is that they think it is only entirely a military solution. It is not. The non-kinetic plays a higher role, and that is where if our youths are engaged, if they are educated, if they are well-fed, if they are well-schooled, well-housed, they will not give in to these terrorists. Like I tell you, on a, de on a weekly basis, we take over thousands down but they keep coming out in numbers. Why is that so? Because we have a lot of them not doing anything. They're just sitting down there and people are ready, just ready tools to be used uh, by these criminals to take advantage. So I can guarantee you that the funds being released are properly utilized. The central bank, the Ministry of Finance, all the procedures they do in checkmating what we do is there. We have the oversight function by the, by the uh, National Assembly that is ongoing. Uh, and also, we have our own mechanism from within that we do that. I can guarantee you, no money is wasted. And when you even look at this money, I tell you this, one precision missile, just a small one, is about $200,000. I'm sure you are aware that everything that we buy, we buy in hard currency, from our ammunition to our, to our bullets, to our bombs, to everything. Everything is bought in foreign currency. Now, if you look at our budget, convert our budget to dollars, and well, I'm happy Rufai is there. Fact check the cost of a ship. Fact check the cost of an MRAP, of a missile, of a drone, of a helicopter, or a fighter aircraft, and see how many we'll be able to buy with, our own, with the budget we have. We know the country is going through so much, so we don't expect to get everything. But the little that we have, we are utilizing them properly. The issue of the uh, uh, military contractors, like I told you, the Americans used them in Afghanistan, in uh, Iraq, in other countries. How did they end up? Bringing anybody out from anywhere to home here, yeah, one, look at the cost. And then he's going to have his own interests. And his interest is not to end it, to aggravate the issue. So you will have more complex issues to even deal with. The Wagner forces in Mali, recently 87 of them were killed. And what did they do? They went there and they got killed by the same terrorists. So we are dealing with individuals that have sworn to kill for whatever reason. And the worst enemy you can ever fight is to fight somebody who has nothing to lose. They have nothing to lose. If they die, nobody cares because they feel they are going straight to heaven or they have some reward somewhere they're going to get. So they are ready to die, they are ready to do this stuff. Like a, a, a reminder, Niger State alone is almost 10% 10, 10 of Nigerian uh, landmass. The Northwest is over 200,000 square kilometers. These are huge massive land area. So what we need to do is first to leverage on technology. If we have enough satellites to be able to give us real-time information, we have enough drones to use. But we cannot have enough, but we're making do what we have. And I can guarantee you, the way it is going, I've said it before, asymmetric warfare is not what you start today and you end tomorrow. It is a gradual thing. It's a painfully drawn kind of war that takes time to heal. But again, it must be deliberate. And it entails all society to be together. Uh, why do you think they are surviving? It's because we have people, informants, that are always telling them. I've always reminded people, the last APC that got uh, bogged, the uh, uh, armor personnel carrier that got bogged, it was the locals that picked and were calling those guys to tell them that our APCs are bogged, they should come there. And they came there in mass. So you find Nigerians that are the ones sabotaging our own efforts. We have unscrupulous elements that think they are making money. In, in, in the Northeast, People will go to a filling station, take full tank, go in there, and sell this fuel to them.
people take food. We have banned the use of uh, urea fertilizer. But we find people hiding them under trucks to go and sell to these guys. Because once you're able to get it across to them, you make good money. And it is that money that people are going after. So we have a lot of sabotage from within and outside that we need to come together and say, look, enough is enough. Nigerians must take ownership of them. And that's the only way that we can do it. So it's not only a military solution. It's a general solution that we need to yeah, adopt. Yes, General, I get that point. But I asked you also about domestic corporate fighters in Nigeria. All these uh, non-state actors that are engaged to monitor our waters and to support uh, the security agents. You have no objections to them? No, no, of, of course. We used, I, I was in the Northeast. I was in the Northeast. I was a theater commander in the Northeast. So you have no objections? Like I said, uh, Dr. Aboti, like I said, is an all society approach. Communities must stand in and be counted. Individuals must stand in and be counted. We cannot be everywhere. And so in the Northeast, what did we do? We got the communities to rally around, select youths that we know are positive youths that don't have any criminal record. They were profiled by the police and the, and the DSS. We gave them some level of training on how to protect their communities. That has assisted us in doing that because we cannot be everywhere. So they do that to delay until the troops come in to take immediate action. That has helped. So we need the support of everyone. In Kano, for example, why did you think Boko Haram could not survive in Kano? People in Kano knowing that they are, they are, they are into commerce, Boko Haram in Kano will cause a lot of problems and it will affect their work. So they refuse. Anywhere they went to rent accommodation, they were reported. Anybody they see that is strange in any community, they reported them and actions were taken. So that is what we're appealing to all communities. Do not allow them to settle in your community. Do not give them any support because when you do that, that's when you encourage them to do. These terrorists survive within the communities. If the communities freeze them, they cannot survive. So that's our appeal. To, to Nigerians. Thank you very much, General C.G. Musa, for your time with us this morning and us just being able to explain the, some of the challenges that the military faces in fighting against terrorism. I echo Rufai's words in saying that we do doff our hat and say, well done. You're doing, you know, with limited resources and hopefully that call for a 25% of the budget going to military efforts as made, um, advocated by the chairman of the Arise This Day Media Group should be taken forward. But thank you so much for your time and and I hope that the people who are watching would well, didn't listen and compliment the efforts of the military.